Hi, Kinesiology 4120. Welcome to our third lecture on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, cardiovascular function um, and changes during exercise as well as respiratory function, um, some different mechanisms for why we ventilate or why we breathe, and how we transport and why we transport different oxygen and carbon dioxide um, throughout different phases within exercise and different needs. So this really is why we link the respiratory and cardiovascular system together. Okay, so the cardiovascular system itself is made up of the circulatory and pulmonary systems. Circulatory systems take blood um, to the rest of the body and then back to the heart. Pulmonary systems take blood from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart. The purposes of this is to transport oxygen to tissues and remove uh, different waste products and transport nutrients to tissues. Um, different things for energy, um, for metabolism, um, and then also to regulate body temperature okay, through, through different um, ways we transport blood throughout our capillaries, moving blood um, to different areas in order to regulate our body temperature. Okay, if we look at our heart, um, you've probably talked a lot about your heart in, in previous biology classes. Um, we have the heart itself is where the blood is pumped. This is the muscular structure that's going to contract to send blood out either to the pulmonary system or to the circulatory system. Um, pulmonary circulation goes from the right side of the heart to the lungs, comes back into the left side of the heart, where the left side of the heart pumps blood out to the rest of the body through the circulatory system. The arteries and arterioles carry blood away from the heart. So rather, regardless of if they're pulmonary or systemic arteries, um, they're going to carry blood away from the heart. Capillaries are the um, small, smallest units of our blood vessels that exchange materials with tissue. So exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients um, with that tissue. Then the veins and the venules will carry blood towards the heart, regardless of if it's pulmonary or systemic veins, they carry blood towards the heart. So that means that our um, pulmonary system, our pulmonary arteries have deoxygenated blood or blood that's low in oxygen content goes to the lungs and then the pulmonary veins take oxygenated blood from the lungs back to the heart to be sent to the rest of the body. Okay, so some differences here, some systemic circuit, so this is to the rest of the body compared to pulmonary circuit, which is to the lungs. Um, systemic circuit is from the left side of the heart. Pulmonary system works from the right side of the heart. Um, systemic circuit, or the systemic circuit pumps oxygenated blood to the whole body through the arteries and returns deoxygenated blood through the veins. The pulmonary circuit pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs from the pulmonary arteries then returns oxygenated blood via pulmonary veins. So it's a flip-flop with oxygenated and deoxygenated veins and arteries. Our heart also functions through um, electrical impulses. So our SA node or sinoatrial node is what um, initiates the cycle of heart contractions, moves to the atrioventricular node, and then that signal runs down um, through the bundle of his into the Purkinje fibers. So this is a in general, we're not going to go too deep into this, but know that the, the sinoatrial node is what stimulates or initiates that heart to beat or to contract. Um, our nervous system can also regulate our heart function um, through the autonomic nervous system. Um, this can, can change how we contract our heart, can increase or decrease our heart rate. Um, we have sympathetic nerves that can stimulate heart rate. We also have parasympathetic nerves that can um, lower our heart rate. Uh, we can alter our heart rate based on um, what's going on within the arteries. So if there's too much pressure, so if those baroreceptors within our arteries are sensing that there's too high a blood pressure, um, that's going to lower our heart rate. Um, and then vice versa, however we need blood to flow throughout the body, we're going to sense and regulate that through our nervous system. Okay. The parasympathetic nervous system has the ability to slow the heart rate by inhibiting the SA node. 
the sinoatrial node, which which wants us to beat at around 100 beats per minute, is kind of the standard. If we're having parasympathetic drive, it's going to inhibit that SA node, so it's going to slow it down through the vagus nerve. So parasympathetic nervous system, remember that's our rest and digest system, uh, causes us to go back to a more um, at ease, not an alarm state, um, by inhibiting the heart from uh, beating at too high a rate. Our sympathetic nervous system can accelerate or increase our heart rate by taking off the inhibition of the SA node and then beginning to stimulate the SA node um, to accelerate that heart rate or, or increase heart rate um, through the cardiac accelerator nerves or those sympathetic nerves to the SA node. So this is where our central nervous system through the autonomic branch is going to control heart rate. If we can find ways through things like respiration, different strategies, we can uh, manipulate our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems to our advantage within training. Um, having a lot of parasympathetic drive while you're in the middle of something that requires high energy, high force, high speed outputs, it's not going to benefit you. But if we can tap into the sympathetic nervous system in those times, it's going to give us a better chance for higher work outputs. So we can manipulate the two. Parasympathetic, the faster we can get back into a parasympathetic state after exercise, the faster we can recover from that individual training session. Um, so they're both positive. One's not good, one's not bad. We just have to use them to our advantage. Okay. Next within that um, system, we also have the skeletal muscle pump. Um, this is where our muscles contract, which pushes blood through the veins back towards our heart, especially in um, aerobic exercise or rhythmic exercise, this helps to transport blood throughout the body at a faster rate so that we can maintain work, especially in those cyclical events. This also has a, a change within more resistance training where it's a very individual bouts, a very forceful, um, longer duration muscle, muscular contractions. These can even occlude veins and arteries um, causing a stoppage of blood um, within those muscles. So if you've ever um, gone through exercise and maybe one body part or in isolation or you're performing multiple reps in a small period of time or isolated contractions for longer periods of time, um, that muscle has seemed to swell. Um, that is the occlusion of blood. So blood is coming in at a slow rate to the muscle and then it's not able to leave that area, which is causing an increase in muscle size initially because our muscle is occluding or stopping blood flow um, to that muscle, uh, which can actually give longer periods of time for nutrients to get into our muscles um, and hormones to stimulate growth or to stimulate repair. So there are some positives, um, but occlusion for too long can be detrimental, um, especially to that performance of the exercise if there's too much occlusion, we're not able to recycle blood. We're going to build up things like blood lactate, which is going to slow down um, work rate or how hard we can work. So there's positives and negatives, but the skeletal muscle pump, this is one of the things why we um, post exercise, especially post aerobic or hard anaerobic work, we continue to move. Uh, like your coach probably in high school said, walk it off after your exercise. Um, they weren't wrong. The, the more movement you can do that the better you're going to pump blood back to your heart and it's not going to pool in your extremities, um, which is going to lessen the heart that, or the, uh, the amount of blood that goes to your brain, uh, which can give you that lightheaded feeling or cause someone to pass out. Because blood is actually being redistributed throughout our body based on our exercise output. Um, so the heavier our exercise is, the more blood that is going to be pushed towards the muscle and away um, from the rest of our body. Um, so things like digestion, it works really well at rest. We're getting more blood flow to our, our gut at rest. However, when we're exercising, we lower the amount of blood going to those areas because we need to redistribute that blood to the heart and to the muscles to continue that exercise work. Okay. Next, we'll talk a little bit about blood pressure. Um, so you've probably heard this in your exercise physiology course, 
um, or before that you have systolic blood pressure, which is the arterial pressure during systole or during while the blood is being pumped through that vessel. And then you have diastolic pressure, which is arterial pressure during diastole or in between um, when the blood is being pumped. So when the, the vessel is at rest, uh, we know that normal blood pressure is between 120 to 180 at rest uh, is below that number and high is above 130 over 85. Um, above 120 over 80 is prehypertensive. Um, this is at rest, not during exercise. Uh, we do need to know this, especially if we're working with different clients that have maybe um, blood pressure issues. Uh, we want to make sure that we know what is normal and what we're, um, what may be some issues. Okay, but what happens to blood pressure when we exercise? Um, when we exercise, more blood is being pumped to those vessels to go to our um, our muscles, which is going to increase blood pressure because there's more blood volume. Um, faster heart rate means more blood is being pumped at a, in a shorter period of time. Larger stroke volume, so more blood is being pumped per beat. Um, there's more peripheral resistance because we have um, things like muscle contraction, including blood. Um, and then there's also blood viscosity increases as our total water starts to go down, especially through sweating. Uh, we lose some hydration, which is going to slow um, how fast our blood can travel through the vessels, which all increases blood pressure um, or arterial blood pressure during exercise. Okay. As we begin to exercise, especially during um, aerobic bouts, um, our heart rate and our cardiac output will go up. Um, linearly with work rate. So as we work harder, heart rate and, and our heart output goes up um, and it reaches a plateau, plateau at 100% VO2 max. So this is as much oxygen as you can take in and utilize for energy before moving to an anaerobic state or primarily anaerobic state. Um, systolic blood pressure increases and diastolic blood pressure stays about the same. So the pressure in your arteries between beats stays very similar except as your beats, so as the stroke volume increases and the heart rate increases, all that systolic pressure is going to go up, okay? And it, our, in order to keep a high cardiac output or make sure that our heart is working at a high rate for long periods of time, um, our stroke volume will start out large, but it will decrease as we continue to exercise. So say you're doing a longer bout of exercise, um, or hard work, um, your heart rate is going to go up throughout that bout and your stroke volume is going to go down because more blood flow is moving to the skin um, to really address that blood prep or the, uh, the skin temperature issue. So as your skin gets hotter, we need to transmit more blood towards the skin so that we can lower our total body temperature so we can maintain exercise output and then there's also dehydration that occurs through sweating um, and metabolic processes that's going to decrease the amount of blood that we have available, lowering the total stroke volume throughout prolonged exercise. Um, so that's something that we need to make sure that we understand as we're doing more longer, maybe conditioning sessions, heart rate is going to go up as exercise continues. Or if you're working with endurance athletes, um, we're going to see a, a higher heart rates as exercise begins to continue. Uh, so there's also some major benefits that come with cardiovascular um, improvements or cardiovascular conditioning can, is, uh, comes from cardiac output, which means that we're able to um, work at a higher heart rate. We also improve our stroke volume. Um, we get better venous return, so we're able to cycle that blood faster. Um, and then we also get better um, work from, from our blood vessels to push blood through um, to our skeletal muscles. Um, so we have a lot of improvements here um, from our cardiovascular system, which can also um, benefit us for things like endurance training. We gain stronger, thicker left ventricles, so we're able to push more blood or have a higher stroke volume. Um, if we can have a higher stroke volume at each or even at any heart rate, our heart's going to be working more efficiently. We're going to have a lesser working or resting and working heart rate. So we become more efficient. Um, 
greater resting and working stroke volume. So our heart is becoming more and more efficient at pumping that blood throughout the body. Um, and it's also going to lower blood pressure because we get this greater capillarization um, at the muscles and at the, at the ends of those arteries of those capillaries where we're transmitting um, oxygen and pulling out CO2, there's more capillaries, more available locations, um, which lowers that, that peripheral resistance so it becomes easier to send blood. Um, but we also are able to transmit more oxygen so we can use more oxygen for that exercise. This is one of the benefits of um, aerobic exercise and aerobic training, especially at the beginning of um, your training cycle for your athletes in the off season. Um, the better their cardiovascular system is working, the faster they can recover from training sessions and practice sessions, um, which can lead to um, harder training and more adaptations earlier on. There's also cardiovascular adaptations from resistance training, um, not really in the VO2 max section, but really in the blood pressure. Um, we talked about earlier in that blood can be occluded with muscle contraction. Um, when blood is occluded, it's going to increase the amount of pressure behind it. So think about if you have um, a, a hose and you kink the hose, there's going to build up pressure behind that point. Or say you're, you're trying to shoot water out of a hose and you shrink the amount of space that is available for that water to come out, it increases the pressure. Um, higher pressure, we have to adapt to be able to handle higher blood pressure so the blood vessels get better at expanding to handle that increased pressure, which can give benefits to blood pressure because if we have more elastic um, arteries, that's going to show us some, some blood pressure benefits because now the pressure isn't going to increase as fast because there's not as much peripheral resistance from the arteries. And this is one of the benefits of resistance training for older adults, um, especially those with blood pressure conditions who can't handle high cardiac outputs. Um, resistance training can help with improving blood pressure um, even without the other VO2 max adaptations. All right, now let's move into the respiratory system. So this is where we're, we're talking mainly gas exchange. We're talking about bringing um, gas from the environment into the body and transmitting gases from our blood into our lungs and from the lungs into our blood to really regulate the acid base and balance during exercise, as well as to bring in oxygen in um, for aerobic metabolism. Okay. If we look at the structure or um, some major components of our respiratory, we have our conduction zone, which is where um, air is brought in, humidified, warmed. Um, this is going through the trachea, the, bron uh, the bronchial tree and the bronchioles. So we're really bringing that air in, we're bringing it up to body temperature, as well as humidifying that air so it's easier um, for us to have that full transmission. And then we have our respiratory exchange zones at the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar sacs where air and blood are able to meet, where we're able to actually uh, work with that pressure gradient to bring oxygen into the blood and take CO2 out of the blood. Okay. Ventilation is when we move air in and out of the lungs. Um, inspiration is when we open up, we move the diaphragm down, we open the intercostals, we lower the interpulmonary pressure. So we, we make the thoracic cavity in the lungs larger to decrease the amount of pressure. Less pressure inside the lungs than the outside air, that air is going to move to the area of lowest pressure. So by opening it up, we let air come in. And then during expiration, the diaphragm relaxes and we um, relax the intercostals and we contract the um, intercostals that can um, bring our ribs closer together to increase thoracic or interpulmonary pressure, increase the pressure of that cavity. Now there's more pressure in our lungs than it is outside in the outside environment. So the air is going to move from our lungs to the environment because um, gas is always moved to the area of lowest pressure. Okay, the resistance to the airflow or what's going to really impede this is the diameter of the airway. So this is what happens when someone has asthma, they um, have an inflammation of the, the bronchioles. 
um, and those that path where air is coming in towards the lungs. If we have a um, smaller area where air can go through, there's more pressure and there's more resistance to airflow. If we have resistance to airflow, we can't get as much air in in the same amount of time, so it feels difficult to breathe. Um, it's kind of like breathing through a straw. Um, this is some of the differences. Um, if we have to um, breathe in a restricted environment, so maybe you have um, one of those altitude masks. It doesn't actually train you in altitude. Um, it just puts more resistance to airflow, which makes your respiratory muscles work harder to inspire and expire air. Okay, but with the, the, from, a, from a general standpoint, all we are really doing is changing pressure, comparing pressure to the atmosphere in our lungs. So when we inspire, we have to lower the pressure in our lungs so that air will come in. When we expire, we increase pressure so air is pushed out. Um, that's, that's really all we're doing is just changing um, the size of the lungs so that we can change the pressure and comparing that pressure to the atmospheric pressure. Um, if we're at higher altitude and the atmospheric pressure is lower, it becomes more difficult to breathe because we have to work harder to lower the pressure within our lungs below that of the atmosphere. If we look at um, CO2 and oxygen movement, um, our blood really wants to get rid of CO2, especially during exercise. Uh, that CO2 is acidic and it's, it's holding off some acidity, especially during exercise, and we wanna get that out because acidity is a problem within our blood. It's going to lower our, our ability to work during exercise. Okay, so in the air, we have a lower pressure of CO2 compared to the partial pressure of CO2 within the blood. So when our blood comes near the alveolar sacs, which is filled with the outside atmospheric air, that CO2 is going to move to the area of lower pressure, which is the alveola. Um, and then oxygen, there's gonna be a lower concentration of oxygen in the blood than there is in the outside air. So oxygen is going to move from the air towards the blood and it's going to do kind of this, this switch. It's like getting on and off a train. Um, and it continues throughout all of the alveolar sacs within our lungs. And this continues every time we um, bring air in and then expire that CO2 out. So what controls this ventilation? What makes us breathe? Okay, we have a respiratory control center in the brainstem that controls our respiration rate. So it, it is auto, automatic or autonomic. We um, have this low level impulse to um, bring air in and, and expire air based on um, some feedback loops um, from how much pressure of oxygen we have, how much CO2 we have, what's the, um, what's the hydrogen content or the acidity content within the blood, um, as well as in the cerebrospinal fluid. That's where the major issue is. If we have too much partial pressure of CO2 in the spinal fluid, we have to breathe out um, because we can't have that high acidity within our spinal fluid. Um, so that's the major driver if we're holding your breath for too long. Um, is our ability to uh, resist that signal is how long we can uh, hold our breath because our body wants to get rid of that CO2 um, as fast as possible because ventilation is really there to control the acid-base balance or the pH within the blood um, by using ventilation, by using the outside air. So increasing ventilation is caused by an increase in CO2 in the blood so we're not actually breathing during exercise to get more oxygen in. We're breathing and breathing harder to get more CO2 out because we're trying to reduce the partial pressure of CO2 within the blood, which lowers the hydrogen ion concentration or the acidity concentration within the blood. Um, the lower, if we have less acidity or kind of closer to neutral pH within the blood, we can continue to exercise and exercise at a high rate. Once we increase the hydrogen ion concentration or um, increase the acidity of the blood, um, this is going to inhibit enzyme activity, which is going to inhibit our ability to break down ATP and cause more muscle contractions. Um, so breathing is actually helping us continue to work harder. 
Um, because within our blood, whenever we release hydrogen ions into the blood, bicarbonate is going to pick up one of those hydrogen ions, which is going to turn into carbonic acid. So this is H2CO3, which then is broken down into H2O and CO2. So we're, we're ending up with a less acidic CO2 because we, we were able to buffer it using bicarbonate. So blood hydrogen ions um, are transitioned into blood CO2 and water, H2O. And with that extra CO2, we have to get it out because it's still um, more acidic than our blood is, but it's less acidic than free hydrogen ions. So then we begin to breathe harder to get more of that CO2 out. Um, the faster we can, or the more we can get out, the harder we can continue to work. And as, as exercise goes up, ventilation goes up, which as we can see, if, if we're becoming more acidic, we need to be able to get rid of that acidity somehow. Okay. And then it will continue to go up um, exponentially after about 75% of, of VO2. As we become more anaerobic, we have to breathe harder to get more CO2 out. Um, and then ventilatory threshold um, is that point where ventilation increases exponentially. So this is where we um, continue to breathe harder and harder and harder as we continue to work. With training, we're able to lower the ventilation necessary. So we're able to actually ventilate more efficiently. Um, so this comes from being able to um, buffer acidity within our muscles by through some um, metabolic processes we'll talk in next week lecture about how we can lower lactate levels, um, be less acidic. So we're working more energy efficient when creating energy. So there's less lactate, which means there's less free hydrogen ions. We don't have to breathe as much to get rid of acidity. Um, so there's less stimulation for breathing and we become more efficient within that entire process. Um, and this is also going to, from a psychological standpoint, lower your perceived work. So if you're breathing hard um, or breathing more frequently, it is going to feel as if you are working harder. Um, the perception of exercise intensity goes up. So by training and improving or reducing the ventilation necessary, we're able to psychologically make exercise, the same amount of exercise, the same work feel easier. Okay, uh, if we look at this from, from trained to untrained um, or, or elite to untrained, um, and we look at oxygen concentrations, um, untrained athletes are, are unable to really work at very low partial pressures of oxygen. So they're not able to really go into that um, high anaerobic state. Um, the pH is maintained at a higher work rate, so we're able to buffer acidity for longer periods of time. Um, the body doesn't become as acidic as quickly, and ventil ventilatory threshold happens sooner in untrained individuals compared to elite individuals. Um, so as you become more energy efficient, you're able to stave off that um, acidity, which means that you don't have to breathe as frequently. So exercise becomes more efficient and feels more efficient um, from a perception standpoint. Okay. Our lungs actually limit for exercise, um, not really during some maximal exercise and even in maximal exercise, your lungs are probably not your limiting factor to endurance or exercise performance. Um, unless you're at maybe altitude, you might see some issues. Um, but that's based on just atmospheric pressure. Um, but for healthy individuals, there's really, um, you're not able, you're not missing out on oxygen coming in. Um, just because you bring oxygen in doesn't mean that oxygen is automatically taken into the blood and, and used for energy. Um, so really your limitation is how much CO2 you can get out and how much acidity you're creating through um, anaerobic and aerobic metabolism that's stimulating that ventilation. Um, so next week we'll get into the bioenergetics of how we create energy and how we create 
those negative byproducts that we're having to breathe out so frequently. All right, I have some review questions for you here, just like all of the rest of our lectures, and then you'll have your quiz uh, on Canvas. But the review questions are, what is the purpose of the cardiovascular system? What's the purpose of the respiratory system? What's the importance of the skeletal muscle pump? Um, list three cardiorespiratory adaptations for endurance training, and which mechanisms are the main drivers for respiration? So why do we breathe? All right, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next week.